light of infinite. This week's Parsha Tzav continues discussing the intricacies of the korbanot, the sacrifices, in the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, and touches on chametz, leavened bread. It's the Parsha before Pesach. Some years it's read on the Shabbat just prior to Pesach, and other years we read it a few weeks before Pesach. Learning the Parsha, we can draw connections between the weekly portion from Vayikra and the larger Jewish story of moving from spiritual constriction into spiritual freedom, from Suffolk, doubt, into salvation. So when this Parsha falls out that we have a few weeks before Pesach to get into the mindset of redemption, I see that as a blessing. My dad was a rabbi and chaplain in the Navy, so he celebrated Pesach all over the world, including Japan and Italy. Whenever possible, he would invite military personnel to the Seder, as well as family and friends. My dad grew up in a kosher home and attended services, but was not fully observant until he started studying in yeshiva during his second year in Jerusalem. He also met my mom, Alava Shalom, and her Yemenite family at that time and took on some of their customs. Not the thick, soft Yemenite matzah that looks like a pita or the kidneya, Hebrew for legumes, but he would allow kidney out at the table to show that it's kosher and part of the tradition to some, even though he personally didn't eat it. In college and later when I moved to Crown Heights with my ex, I was exposed to Chabad's Pesach customs through their family. To them, it's important not to eat any kibrachs, Yiddish for matzah, that has come into contact with water during the seven days of Pesach. So I would have to sneak <laughs> and dip my matzah into the chicken soup bowl because that was the only way that I could do my favorite thing during Pesach. My mom's Yemenite tradition is to wrap the matzah in wet cloth and always to eat it wet and soft. It's only recently that I really began to delve into the meaning of Pesach. I realized that the Seder is not just a historical retelling of the Jews' exodus from Egypt, but an actual manifestation, an opportunity for each of us to leave our own Egypt. And through this ritual, we're meant to free ourselves to burn the chametz that holds us back from seeing and living in full truth, emet, from being fully connected to the infinite light, or HaKodesh. As it's written in the Zohar, God does not dwell in a fragmented place. In his notebook, Rav Cook writes, The reality of Hashem's providence is discernible when the world is seen in its totality. The divine presence is not manifest in anything defective, since Hashem does not abide where there is deficiency. How can Hashem abide where everything is lacking, where all we have is the weak and puny entity, only the particularity of the ego? This call to be committed always to the principle of universality, to the divine ensemble where all things have their being, is the essence of the soul of the righteous who walk before Hashem and whose delight is in the divine. I love how poetic Rav Kook is. It reminds me of Avram Joshua Heschel. Something I always think about, especially after Purim, looking towards Pesach, is that we must remember through the story of enslavement that we too were once slaves and that as Dr. King reminds us, no one is free until we are all free. Redemption is when the light of universality shines. It's our task to usher in that revelation. This starts with our own sanctuaries and shines out from there, nullifying the ego so the screens of separation between us all begin to fall. The Alter Rebbe teaches in Tanya that the basis and root purpose of the entire Torah is to elevate and exalt the soul high above the body to God, the source and root of all worlds, and to draw down the Ein Sof, the infinite light. And only when we place primary importance of our soul over our bodies can the walls that separate us come down and be replaced with love and unification. It's our bodies that separate us from each other while the soul binds us. When one focuses on the body, the separation between us becomes apparent, and only the love we create can bind us. But a created love can never equal a natural and innate love. So love between people whose primary importance is focused on the physical, on the body over the soul, is based on external factors and endures only as long as those factors remain in play. Only when we shift our focus towards the soul over the body, of oneness over self, of the unifying and infinite light of the creator of all creations over the differences of the elements of creation, can infinite love exist in its purest state. In this week's Parsha, Hashem provides the instruction for the priestly meal offerings, sacrifices that did not involve animals. Moshe is told that the meal offering shall not be baked leaven. I have presented it as their share from my fire offering. In Shemot, when Hashem gives the commandment of Pesach, it's written, No leaven, chametz, shall be found in your houses for seven days. For whoever eats what is chametz, that person shall be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a citizen of the country. Chametz literally means leavening, that which causes bread to rise. Chazal teach us that the chametz represents arrogance and the evil inclination, the Yetzir Hara. In Talmud Bracha, the Yetzirah is depicted as the yeast in the dough, puffing up a person's pride. The Talmud explains that the portion of the meal offering eaten by the Kohen 
is not allowed to be offered on the altar, the Mizbeach. A priest is dependent on divine gifts for their bread, so they cannot succumb to haughtiness or arrogance. But we, we have to work for our bread with the sweat of our brow after Adam's sin. The more we accumulate and think it's by our own doing, the more the evil inclination manifests in the form of ego, haughtiness, and arrogance. Matzah, the central symbol of Pesach, is the antithesis of Chametz. It's known as Lechem Oni, the bread of poverty and affliction. Matzah signifies the humility that comes with poverty. And so the mitzvah obligation to eat matzah can only truly be fulfilled if it's eaten with humility. The matzah that the Israelites ate in Egypt was Lechem Oni, and so too the matzah that we eat on Pesach reminds us to be humble. Bitul Hayesh, to negate and nullify all traces of ego and self-centeredness, to transcend the illusion of self. It's no coincidence that matzah and chametz are both composed of the same letters. The only difference is matzah is spelled with a hay and chametz with a chet. We see that the letter chet is completely closed from the three sides, symbolizing that sin crouches at the entrance, while the hay has an opening on top, which means there is always an opening above indicating the possibility to return to the light. As our sages say, open for me as little as the eye of a needle, and I will open for you like the entrance to a hall. Rabbi Nachman teaches that each and every person, even the most wicked, must find the good point in themselves, and that one point, however small, can bring them to merit in goodness itself. As we see in Talmud Kedushin, one single thought of self-improvement can change someone from a wicked person into a righteous person. And as Yishai Ribo sings in the Shuv Habayita, the time has come to wake up, to leave everything, to overcome, and to return home. As physical creatures, we can't fully defeat the forces of fate, but our souls, the parts of us that are infinite, can connect beyond this finite world. When we choose to burn the chametz, the false sustenance of pride and devotion to material gain, we can surpass our limitations and connect to the true and everlasting freedom that can only be found in the light of the infinite. Shabbat Shalom.